The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first webinar of 2018. Uh, my name is Anthony. Uh, this will be on the topic of Electrical Safety Testing 101. This is um, <clears throat> going over general electric safety compliance, electrical shock hazards, um, and some other topics. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce our team. Again, my name is Anthony Arroyo. I'm an application applications engineer here with uh, Iconix USA. Um, our panelists today will be Saeed Abidi. He's our applications, he's also an applications engineer here. And our organizer is Brittany Soha. She will be in charge of making sure this webinar is the most interesting one ever. So if you're having any issues with hearing me or seeing me, <clears throat> please reach out to her through our chat box. If you are looking for a copy of this webinar, she can also provide you with that. We have an archive of all our webinars actually on YouTube. Um, our YouTube channel is AR Hypot, A R H Y P O T. There's actually a lot of good material dating back many years, um, with many different topics. Um, so that's always a good resource. But today, our objectives will be talking about safety, how to create a safe workstation, what OSHA requires, or what OSHA considers a safe workstation. There it is. Wouldn't be a webinar without one of these. Um, testing, we'll talk about why we test, um, the difference in class one, class two products. Um, and then we'll give you some links to some testing resources, as well as talk about some of our consultation services. Um, again, our objectives are to recognize an electrical safety hazard, set up a safe workstation, um, and identify what current does to our human body. Um, so speaking of, let's talk about some of the hazards when HIPOT testing, right? Our HIPOT testers can go up to 20,000 volts, but that's not really the dangerous part. The dangerous part is how much current can it provide. And we do have 500 VA testers due to certain standards uh, dictating that you must test um, with a 200 milliamp short circuit current um, requirement, which requires a 500 VA tester. Um, this is why we have those in our model lineup. But that gives you up to 100 milliamps of uh, steady leakage potentially coming out of that tester. So. What happens in an incident like that is um, there's a few different ways to get shot, right? Shocked. So the first one would be, um, you know, if you have a, a, a frayed wire that uh, has line voltage on it and it comes into contact with um, some sort of metal workstation or um, any type of metal conductive surface, now that whole area is at the high side of voltage, right? Um, now. If you're touching the low side, like an example on the top left, right? We're we're all technically on um, one point, one reference point of voltage, right? We're earth ground. We're always standing on the low side, so which isn't dangerous, right? Contact the low side of voltage places operator at same potential as ground. Therefore, there is no potential difference, um, and without a potential difference, there is no force to push current through us. Um, so this is kind of what we um, deal with every day, right? This is, we don't get shocked. We're on the low side coming into contact with um, the low side of a voltage. There's no danger. But, um, you know, I think one of the electrical questions is, right, how do birds land on um, voltage uh, cabling and high voltage cables? and not get shocked. Well, it's the same thing, right? It takes two points of reference to, to move current, and they are only standing on the high side, so there is no danger there, because they're, they're, they're not in contact with the low side, so no potential difference uh, between them, so no current can flow. Now, when we, when we are standing on ground, um, for the most part, all of our uh, 
of our power systems are, are typically grounded systems, right, in our homes, in our buildings. Um, somewhere it eventually gets referenced to earth ground. And so when we come into contact with the high site, we're completing that loop there. And current can now uh, return to ground by flowing through us. Um, again, that was kind of the example of um, a frayed cable. Um, let's talk about hypot testing, right? If I'm, if I'm hypot testing and while my alligator clip is attached to my DUT, but there is some breaks in the insulation or fraying in the cable, that cable is lying on um, my workbench and I happen to touch my workbench, well now I've just ex been exposed to high voltage, I'm standing on ground and current has a path to return to ground. Um, contact with the high side of voltage while standing on ground allows a path for current to return to ground through the operator. You know, with HyPot testing, most standards say we're looking for breakdown, right? And so uh, it's it's common to leave for people to leave their high limits at um, defaults. But when you do that, when you're just looking for ground, um, that means you're allowing. I mean, when just when you're just looking for breakdown and you're not really setting a high limit, um, you're allowing your tester to say leak as much as you can um, until you start to protect yourself and give me a breakdown failure. But I think it's important to kind of use some of our parameters like high limits to also dictate how much current this tester will put out before it shuts off. Um, because in a, in a potential, in a scenario like we did, like I discussed earlier, you know, where your, where your operator is getting shocked, you, you want them exposed to the least amount of current as possible. Um, so in this example, this is an isolated power source. Um, in theory, it's safe, right? Because it's no longer referenced to ground. So when I'm standing on ground um, and I touch the high side, I should not be shocked because, you know, current wants to return back to its source. And ground does not provide a path back to the source of an isolated uh, power source. Um, so making contact with, with any point of the circuit while standing on ground does not allow current a path back to the source. Now, this might be a bit of an intricate way to do it, but the danger with an ungrounded power source is the possibility of accidentally grounding or contact made with two points of the circuit. So we see here, we have the same situation as above, right? An operator coming into contact with a isolated circuit but with another operator contacting that same circuit, well now ground does have a path back to the source of that current. And uh, through the top operator's arms, uh, through ground, back through the leg of the second operator, back through his hand and uh, back to the source. So these are just examples of how, uh, depending what type of, of source you have, what type of high voltage, high pot tester, or just wall power, um, there's always a way to get shocked. And it's important that we take the steps to alleviate any of those hazards by creating a safe workstation, all right? Which is something that um, we're told to do uh, via certain standards. Now, another way that an, someone can get shocked that maybe we don't think about enough is um, having capacitive DUTs or just um, accidentally creating a capacitive situation where it was never intended, but now we have charge stored somewhere and it's just waiting for someone to touch it and get shocked. So capacitors, they consist um, of conducting surfaces separated by a dielectric material. Um, the effect of this is when voltage is applied, current or charge flows into the capacitor and is stored. Um, and then it's just stored there waiting for something to discharge it. So caps react against a change in voltage, right? So a change in voltage is um, where the danger is because it's constantly charging by drawing current or discharging by supplying current. And while an AC high pot test, you can kind of get away with not having um, a ramp down or anything because like we just said, right? It's gonna be constantly charging and discharging. So ideally at the end of the high pot test, it, there's not much charge left on it. Plus we do have a discharge circuit at the end of all high pot tests, which, you know, if you're within our capacitive loading specs, 
we promise to discharge your DUT um, by the time your test is over. Um, but the issue <clears throat> can come into play with a DC HIPAA test um, because I'm ramping up to get to my voltage, so now I've just charged that capacitor, but I'm never ramping down. I maintain um, that same voltage throughout the test, and so now uh, I've just left, whether it's a spool of cables, a heating element, or a motor, you know, there's there's charge left on that DUT at the end of your HIPAA test, and if that's not take, accounted for with, uh, you know, an adequate ramp down time or again we do have a lot of customers that test beyond our capacitive loading specs now specs is kind of what we guarantee i mean we it's not a surprise that our hypo testers perform above their specs you know same with voltage right we guarantee two percent accuracy but we're usually way more accurate than that but specs is um is what we guarantee and while customers will test outside of those specs and still see the HIPAA test you perform as expected, it doesn't mean that you're not slowly causing damage to the tester, especially if you're discharging um, more charge than we than we spec out, we can handle um, over time that uh, return port, which is seeing all this charge um, being discharged through the um, impedance of our transformer um, can potentially lead to issues. So it's important to to identify what your capacitive specs are for your DUT, compare them to what we have in our specs, saying this is the maximum loading you can do, and then either compensate by having a long uh, ramp time, which is just to alleviate that charging current, um, and also have a long ramp down time to make sure there's enough time to discharge your capacitive load. Hope that makes sense. So now let's talk about the effects of electrical current on the human body. Mm, it usually takes about half a milliamp to a milliamp for us to just perceive shock, right? Obviously it's different with um, most people, but at that point you're starting to, to feel a tingle or uh, almost like a vibration. Um, once you ramp that up to five milliamps, you start getting a slight shock, a startled reaction. Um, six to 30 milliamps, you you get a painful shock and an inability to let go. Um, I know they, they have um, those pulse kind of massage electrical shock therapies where you put a couple pads and, um, you know, it's true. I did that once before, put one here and one here. And once you get up to the mid 20s to 30s, you know, my fist clenched up and it took a lot for me to open it. Um, so you, you do lose control of your, you know, uh, motor function. So imagine if I'm in a situation where I'm getting shocked, um, higher current, I can't let go. I'm stuck in a, in a situation where I can't leave the situation. I'm getting shocked, and that's kind of what we see in those dangerous scenarios where people get seriously hurt. Um, and so 6 to 3 milliamps, six, I'm sorry, 6 to 30 and then 30 to 150, right? That's in the high pot range. That's what something that your high pot tester can give you. Um, I think our new high pot 4s come with 20 milliamps AC, AC current, if I'm not mistaken. And like I said previously, we have 500 VA testers that can do, that can steadily give you like 99 milliamps without breaking down. So to reiterate, right, this is where maybe you want to, while standards say, hey, no breakdown shall occur, and so you're hitting your product during a HIPAA test and making sure that tester doesn't say breakdown, but if your high limit is set to, you know, its maximum number possible, which would be about 100 milliamps or 20 milliamps, depending on your instrument, well, now you're saying, hey, I'll put as much current as you can during a HIPAA test only when your internal transformer is being you know, it's oversaturated and doing too much work where it's forced to shut down, which is called a breakdown. That's what a breakdown is, right? Our transformer will output as much current as it can until it sees more being drawn than it can supply. Then it's going to say breakdown or some other testers might say um, OFL, overflow leakage. Um, that's, you don't want that to be your limit, you know, 
especially if there's a chance an operator might be getting shocked, right? If 50 milliamps are flowing through him, but your high pot tester um, is still, or it takes that long for uh, you, your high pot tester to send something, right? And you don't want to create a situation where uh, an operator can get shocked more by more current than he needs to. Um, so that's why we usually default our testers at 10 milliamps. Um, once you get past the 30 to 150 milliamp stage, um, you know, obviously death is possible, cardiac arrest, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, we have an example here of the prede predecessor to the new high pot for the 3705, which again, like I said, can do 20 milliamps of AC current. So high pot testing is, is a dangerous field to be in. Um, it's important to uh, take caution, and we'll talk about ways you can do that um, coming up in the next slides. Obviously, the severity of shock received by a person is influenced by several factors. Uh, the frequency of the supply, uh, the higher frequency you'd expect, uh, the more damage done, the duration or length of a time the person is exposed, right? We, we have a smart GFI built into our hypot testers, meaning the smart part is, hey, I can identify when your DUT is, is grounded, right? And I can, if your DUT is grounded, then I know current might flow to ground, and so I don't need to worry about it not returning to our return port. But that's the smart part. But the important part is just the GFI part, right? If I'm a high pot tester and this is my HV port and my return port, I'm applying high voltage across your DUT and the current that's flowing through one end of the transformer uh, being drawn from a high voltage port flowing through your insulation, your high pot tester expects that same amount to come back through the return port. And so when it sees a difference there of, I think it's set to five milliamps sometimes, um, could be less on some of your instruments, that's settable, that's a settable value. Well, if I see a difference there, that means I've just lost some current. I don't know where it went. I'm going to shut off because it could be shocking an operator right now. So uh, I think our smart GFI is a feature that distinguishes us from some of the competitors. Um, and it's important that you find out uh, whether you have a hard set one, a settable one, maybe identify the value that you want to use. Again, that, that can be triggered by just your test setup as well, right? Do you just have a leaky test setup? Are you, are you doing a lot of tests beyond the high pot test through your test system? And you know that current just happens to leak because it's just an elaborate test system. That could trigger a GFI. So, um, on, again, in some instruments, that's able to be turned off or set at a higher value where you're not getting these false failures every time. Uh, so the four main types of electrical injuries, this is uh, defined by OSHA. Um, electrocution, obviously, which is a uh, fatal um, electric shock, burns, and falls caused as a result um, of contact with electrical energy. So let's talk about the human body, right? We're kind of just one big wire with about, or one big resistor, you can think about it. The human body on average has about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 ohms in res of resistance. The outer layer of the skin provides the largest percentage of the body's electrical resistance. So, so just as any cable, right? The, the insulation is what's protecting um, the outside and inside from current escaping. The interior of the cable has a conductive path um, just as we do, right? We have blood vessels and our nervous system, which are great conductors um, meant to send, you know, low pulses through our body to, to make our heart beat and, and help us, you know, motor functions. Um, these the parts of our body, like I just said, which conduct electricity the best, our blood vessels and our nerves. And so if you look at this operator here, current has a few different paths to flow through him, right? It can enter his arm and go down through his leg if he's referenced to earth. Um, I think if you go from one arm to the other arm, that's what we consider kind of the most dangerous path because now you're messing with uh, your, your chest cavity where your heart's at, um, that this is where defibrillation can occur. And um, that current alters the, the pattern of your heartbeat and this is why it's important to maybe have a defibrillator um, around all your high pot test stations 
um, as we do here. Uh, going back to an operator coming into contact with line voltage, which in the US is 120 volts, <clears throat> the current required to, to light a seven watt bulb, um, you know, if that's passed across the chest is enough to cause fatality because using Ohm's law, V equals IR, um, we want to identify the I, we see that 120 divided by 1,000, that gives us 120 milliamps. And so if we were to go back to that previous table, now we're in that stage of extremely painful respiratory arrest, ventricular fibrillation, and death is possible. Um, again, we're just kind of hammering home the, the potential dangers when being exposed to line voltage, when uh, having unqualified workers near your HyPOT tester. Um, these are things that need to be taken into account when developing a safe workstation. Uh, so let's get into why we test, right? These are the four main reasons why either our customers or your customers are using our HyPOT testers and why they're going to UL or TUV, CSA to make sure they're passing certain standards, right? Um, these aren't in any particular order, but they're all interconnected, right? Safety, safety is huge. We want to ensure that the product is not going to pose a hazard to the end user because when we release a product and, it, and it's not posing a hazard, well, what does that develop? That develops quality, right? Our product is known to have quality, a good reputation. We've now done uh, solid testing. We've detected all workmanship defects, whether in the type testing phase or in the production phase. And we've identified that we've created um, you know, a safe design. So in our in our type testing phase, that's more the prototype, right? We're, we're going to test our new product in normal and even abnormal situations. We want to identify a characteristics of how it's going to perform when certain fault conditions might happen out in the field. Um, and then your routine test is something that now that you've solidified your design, a routine test might be like a high pot test and a ground bond test at the end of a line somewhere before they're getting shipped out. And this is what we see when we visit our customers, right? We're usually going to a production facility. They're letting us know that we're using your high pot tester either 24 seven for five days a week where we're doing one second tests this many time or our product is this capacitive. We're seeing your, your tester react this way and, and we can kind of identify some of the characteristics of our testers, which we use to either improve or just um, identify why our testers behave a certain way, uh, which goes to cost control, right? We want to identify production problems before a product is shipped, preventing costly recalls. And then uh, liability, we want to pre prevent product liability suits because the responsibility of performing electrical safety tests ultimately rests on the manufacturer. Um, that, that falls um, on us as well, right? As a high pot manufacturer, if we've been releasing a lot of new products lately, and while we test them for every um, scenario, you know, it's not till it gets in the field, um, do we kind of see maybe um, certain attributes that we weren't expecting, um, and you know, we'll develop a new firmware or hardware modifications to to alleviate that. At the end of the day, testing just comes down to risk analysis, right? Safety standards call for production, high pot and continuity test, but we've seen a shift where a standard is just the minimum you can do, right? A standard says, hey, it's passed this test, get a 70, but some companies uh, wanna go above the standards and say, well, while I understand all I have to do is pass a one second high pot and uh, guarantee continuity in my ground circuit, you know, I want to, maybe identify a characteristic of my product. I want to do a 60 second high pot or I want to do a high pot at a little higher voltage to make sure leakage stays the same. Um, or I want to do uh, leakage testing, right? Production, how in recent years, a lot of people have now also just been identifying what's my ground leakage uh, cur current value, right? Which is called earth leakage or enclosure leakage, um, which is a term we, we use uh, LCT, leakage current testing. Um, that our Omnium models can do, our 620L line check can do. 
Um, so again, the onus kind of falls on your client and your customers to either just meet the standards or go above and beyond to develop the quality and uh, alleviate some of the risks that we talked about. Um, speaking of testing and, and who people test with, um, you know, in Europe, the government is kind of enforces uh, that you need to meet these certain standards. Um, everything must be CE listed before it enters. Where in the U.S., the government kind of doesn't stay involved, but instead we have these nationally recognized testing laboratories and uh, standard committees, which come up with uh, standards which will say, you know, if you pass this, your product is considered safe. And a lot of people use underwriter laboratories for this, TUV Rhineland, um, CSA, uh, which would be the Canadian Standards Association, um, Intertech, um, Electrical Testing Laboratories, and uh, CCC, to just name a few, right? There's, there's a ton of even small private companies that will do your testing for you, kind of give you uh, the data, and you can either self-list or you can have peace of mind that, well, before I send this to UL and get this huge charge, huge fee, I've already kind of consulted someone and know it's going to pass. Um, we're actually, um, Iconics USA and Associated Research, we're getting into consulting and um, not quite testing your product for you, but uh, reviewing your standards, identifying what tests you need to uh, conform to um, will identify the best test station for you um, we can kind of qualify your system that way when you're being audited by anyone you, you have that documentation ready for you uh, come in and set up the test station make sure the proper test files are installed and uh, just a variety of services that um, again if you wanted to reach out to Brittany she can provide more information on that so with that, um, just to kind of see maybe where our customer base stands or who they trust their testing to, we have um, a poll question here, um, a simple one, just which lab do you certify with? Um, there's probably more options than, than what you see here, um, such as, uh, you know, UL, ETL, TUV are kind of um, the big players. Obviously, CSA is huge as well. Um, and some people, again, self-certify, right? They, they just want to have a CE label there so we'll open this up Brittany will open up the polls allow you some time to answer these questions and from there we could just kind of see where you lie relative to what the market is kind of testing right now obviously UL has been um, the biggest testing lab in the US for quite a while they're um, headquartered here in Northbrook Illinois and uh, as is ETL and TU, ETL at least. All right, Brittany, do we have any? Yep. Yes, we have the answers. 41% um, say UL, 14% say ETL, 9% TUV, 23% self certification, and 14% say other. Okay, so that's those are about the numbers we expected. Um, UL, TUV, <clears throat> ETL, they also give you the ability to, right, once you have passed the type testing phase, now you're you're allowed to hypo test at your production facility, and maybe they'll come audit you every six months or once a year, and this is where, um, some before we get into this, this is where some of our customers will call us and say, hey, we just got audited, and we got dinged because... I don't have my calibration certificate or they asked me how do I verify that your tester this, this tester works every day right and these are these are fine details that are in the standards you're testing to but maybe the standards are pretty hard to read the language is is very technical um, there's some other parts where you just don't see that it says yes you need to verify every day you need to you know have uh, calibrated by an A2LA uh, you know 170 to five uh, certified calibration lab um, and so these are important things you must consider as well when either picking a manufacturer of your hypo tester um, we do uh, we sell they're available you know test verification boxes which uh, 
you'll be able to use before every shift to see if your tester is functioning correctly. We also have fail check uh, feature, which is kind of like a quasi verification method. It's more used for troubleshooting and just to identify that your failure detectors are working properly. Um, would it pass an audit? Again, every auditor is different. Uh, we usually don't see that happen, which is why um, customers are forced to either buy a, a TVP box, or I'm sorry, a test verification box, or even a, a calibrated resistor, uh, which is something we also have to just identify that you're, with the resistor, you can confirm that the proper amount of current is being drawn from your HyPot tester as well as verify the voltage, right? Because with the current, you can identify uh, what the actual output is. So now we can come into more, uh, you know, standard lingo, which is like class one, class two products. NRTL's standards dictate that electrical component or products incorporate two lines of defense to protect the user from electrical shock. Insulation is obviously used on every product. It separates power lines from low voltage circuits. Um, it separates power lines from isolated power supplies and more for what you guys use, right? It, it isolates the line voltage going into your product from any part of your product that the customer can come into contact with. Now, the second most common line of defense that we see on uh, customers products is safety grounds right uh, they allow dangerous fault currents to return to the system ground they enable circuit breakers circuit breakers to open and um, they're a safeguard against fire right because if that ground wasn't there and there's fault current leaking somewhere to a component that wasn't expecting it well now that can be uh, heated up and potentially catch fire um, which obviously that's what protects against damage to electrical equipment so a class one product is kind of what we see more nowadays, which is a product that terminates in a three prong line cord, which is a line neutral and ground. Um, the ground prong connects to the product chassis and safety through the basic insulation and proper grounding. So those are the two lines of defense that someone who's creating a class one product is using. Class two products, well, let's stay on class one products. So I now have three prongs. How do I perform a high pot test on that, right? Again, we want to isolate your current carrying conductors from any access point that your customer may come into contact with. And so we know that any point on the chassis they can come into contact with, we know the chassis is always grounded. And so now those are our two sides of a high pot test and the insulation is in between those. And so what you do is apply high voltage to your line neutral or the high side, obviously, of high voltage, the high reference point of high voltage to your line and neutral, short it together and return on either your chassis or the ground stud of your line cord. Uh, conveniently, we kind of supply you with an adapter box where you just kind of have to plug your product into uh, the adapter box and we already isolate, we short line and neutral for you provide high voltage through our adapter box and return on the ground prong. Um, but if you don't have access to that or some companies don't provide that, then you just find a way to short your line in neutral, alligator clip those together, you return on the chassis, your grounded chassis, make sure there's not a point where there's paint on it that might uh, you know, give you extra insulation you're not intending, make sure it's more like a dead metal point, right? Now, class two product does not use a ground circuit. It's more, um, it uses double insulation, right? So it just might be a different type of uh, material used with higher uh, impedance, resistivity. Um, those just terminate in a two prong line cord, line and neutral. And the manufacturer provides safety through dual layer of insulation. But standards still call out that class two products need to be hypot tested as well. And so how does one HyPot test without a ground circuit, right? Because we just said you want to test the insulation between your current carrying conductors, which is our line of neutral, which our class two products do have, and 
access points uh, that the customers might touch. And so I no longer have a conductive path on the exterior of my product or on the chassis of my product. So where would I clip my return to? Well, in standards, it actually says, you know, if you are using a class two product, uh, what can what can we use to, to give your product a conductive uh, chassis point, right? Which is, we can use aluminum foil. Just take aluminum foil, you wrap your class two product um, around, right, the chassis or uh, the insulation. And now when applying high voltage and running a high pot test, any leakage that goes through the insulation now has a uh, conductive path uh, that to flow on and if we clip our return clip to that foil, well, now you have access to our uh, return port and we can measure the leakage. Uh, a lot of customers also use conductive saline solutions. They can um, dip their product in a saline solution, um, create a return through some sort of electrode that is dipped in that solution as well. And that's a that's not as common as foil, but it is another method to, to run a high pot test. Getting back to electrical accidents in the workplace, most electrical accidents in the workplace are as a result of one of the following three factors, right? Unsafe equipment or installation. So a lot of people are still using old high pot testers that maybe didn't even show you the leakage value or it's just a knob to choose the voltage. Um, again, if you don't really know what you're leaking, and some of those old testers no longer have manuals out there, no longer, you no longer know what its trip point is, so you don't really know what the product is leaking. So while we're fully aware that we create hypot testers that'll last 20 years, um, you know, our new hypot testers have added features which just makes it safer for your operator and a, a safer workstation overall. And I know our sales department offers trade-in values for those um, and whatnot and after a while you know we just no longer have the parts to support or repair those older units even though you know they last a long time it's it's still important that you're you're updating your, your test stations uh, with some of our latest equipment an unsafe environment right again this kind of goes back to uh, are you doing everything you can to make sure your operator cannot get shocked, which goes to an unsafe work practices, right? Are they trained? Do they understand what's actually happening during a high pot test, that there's high voltage, uh, you know, no more than a few feet away from you, and if you're exposed to the high side of that red clip and you're grounded, well, you're gonna trigger a GFI, sure, but to trigger a GFI, current needs to be seen. Uh, leaking somewhere else and where's that going that's going through your operator so these accidents again can be prevented through the use of insulation guarding grounding electrical protective devices and safe work practices so I think in the next coming slides we'll start talking about some of the products you can use to create a safe workstation so how do you create a safe work area um, operator training I think that's kind of an important one right if your operator can identify these hazards and has a complete understanding of what's going on within the tester, um, that in it alone just makes your test a, safe, a safer work area. That's also part of our consulting program, right? We'll come out, we will detail the dangers in high pot testing, we'll go a, a, a thorough once over of the high pot tester, what it does, what the ports mean, um, what are some things we've seen in the field that while all the information you need is in the manual. You know, we've seen some unsafe work practices that maybe aren't easily to identify that we'll speak about. We'll talk about um, electrical safety testing 101, 102. What are these tests? What's actually happening to your product and uh, the physics behind high current being passed through, high voltage being passed through. Um, so again, if, if you wanted info on some of our consulting services, feel free to reach out to Brittany. Um, we can also kind of assess your current workstations and identify potential shock hazards. Um, also utilizing safety devices, creating um, what's called a positive protection uh, work area, which means you've kind of built in redundancies in your testing where operators 
unless they are being irresponsible, can no, can no way get shocked, right? This is DUT enclosures, signal tower lights, insulation mats, et cetera. We're going to talk about those in the next few slides. Um, it's, the the, it's the responsibility of the employer to ensure safe working conditions and safe working environments for all test operators. So again, we talked about an enclosure, which is designed to remove the shock hazard. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Using PPE, right, positive protective equipment. Um, if you go on our website and go to accessories, you'll see a huge variety of PPE, which is just built-in redundancies beyond just our GFI and our interlock that can provide uh, extra layers of protection for your operators and just get you through those, you know, OSHA audits or UL audits that uh, just gives you peace of mind. Something as simple as a, a danger sign, right? To let untrained uh, employees, people that are just walking through the lab, know that, hey, this area is not for you to walk through because high voltage test area and you can get uh, hurt. Cabling and insulation. So this is another thing, right? Our testers can output up to 20 kV or can can output up to 60 amps. So it's important that you understand that we give you our accessories rated for those values, right? So we understand that sometimes people, companies, operators, you might use these cables over and over and they might be they might start fraying. Well, it's important to come back to the manufacturer to get the exact replacement part because there are secondary, you know, cabling and and lead companies, but you're just you don't know if they're they might look exactly the same, but they just might not be the same rating. So here we have a picture of um, a test station with positive protection. We see the positive protection comes from that DUT enclosure. What that enclosure does is it's controlled by the uh, HIPAA testers interlock, right? Associated research instruments provide an interlock, a hardware interlock, and also an interlock via our firmware, right? So it's kind of a, a dual redundancy interlock. That means that if two pins on our signal input are not shorted together, that tester will never output. It's, it's like the key to your car. Right, you can get in your car and you can uh, turn on, or you can move the seats and whatnot. But unless that key's in there, you're not driving. And so that DUT enclosure is connected to that interlock. And if that door is open, that tester will never output. Only when the door is closed will a high bot test be performed. So that's what we consider positive protection, a redundancy, where I know there's no way this door. The only way my operator can touch this product is with the door open. And I know there's no way the HIPAA tester will output with the door open, so I've now just created positive protection. Um, we also have our e-stop switch, which someone who uh, you know wasn't using the DUT enclosure and somehow an operator is getting shocked and now they're in that stage where they can't let go, you know, e-stop cuts off power to the whole line. Um, if you have visitors, which we often do, customers walking through our facilities, you know, that danger high voltage sign lets them know, you know, this area is not one where we can go. We also see the 10 foot rule, the 10 foot rule. The 10 foot rule is, comes directly from OSHA um, policy stating if you have a qualified worker, you've trained them to run this high pot tester, that's great. But anyone not trained must stay at least 10 feet away from that high pot tester. Now, they also say that you are the one who gets to identify what's considered a trained HIPAA tester. So if you feel someone who you've showed how to turn on and where the high voltage uh, port is, is considered qualified, that's fine. But again, it, it all comes down to liability of the company. So positive protection isn't always possible, right? Because everyone isn't testing small products or everyone doesn't manufacture small products that fit into a DUT enclosure. And so the next best thing is uh, a test station with no positive protection, but you've still taken uh, the steps to ensure that unqualified workers are nowhere near the HIPAA tester. And as you can see here, now we are testing a dishwasher, or I'm sorry, a washer dryer. A DUT enclosure can't be used. And so we've 
guarded off a 10 foot area where unqualified people can't enter. We still have our e-stop switch. We now have um, our, our tower light. Tower light, which we also sell, is connected to our signal output. What does our signal output do? Our signal output gives you a few different uh, signals. It, it gives you a, a fail signal, a pass signal, and a processing signal. And so by hooking our tower light to that signal output, I know that when my test is either failed or is still processing, meaning I'm still in my dwell time, that light will be red to let people know, hey, do not walk near here. Um, once I get a pass signal, then the light turns green, lets people know, you know, hey, your product either passed or hey, it's safe to walk through here now. We also have our insulation mat, right? A t an, an operator will not get shocked if he is uh, a loose cable, right? If he's if he's just a loose cable hanging in the air, which is what that mat does, right? It creates isolation between him and ground, and that mat is, I believe, rated to. Uh, I'd have to look again, right? like 30 kV. I believe it's 60 kV. It's it's a ridiculous amount, obviously, more than our hypo testers can output to make sure that there's no chance of your operator getting shocked. Okay, so that's the scenario for people who are testing bigger products that don't fit in DUT enclosures. Here's some additional methods of operator safety. Let me see how we're doing on time. Okay, this is our dual palm remote switches. So these kind of work similar to our DUT enclosure, right? I said our DUT enclosure, if it's open, the tester will not output. Well, in this scenario with your DPRs, the tester will only output if both buttons are pressed within half a second and they need to be uh, continually pushed throughout the test or it will abort. And so what's that do? That keeps your operator's hands busy, nowhere near the product, nowhere near the hypo tester. And if for a second he tries to lift them up, well, the test just stopped and it's not going to output anymore. Um, so this is uh, one of our newer products that we released, I think, last year. Um, and a lot of people have implemented in their in their workstations to just have those extra redundancies to make sure operators uh, are safe. Um, again, reiterating what our tower light does. It's more for people who aren't using the HyPot tester but are in the in the area. This can let them know it's either safe to walk um, or not. It also lets you know um, if a test has passed or failed. Um, so again, it illuminates red when a test is active or has failed and is also green when uh, you are now receiving that test, or I'm sorry, that pass signal from the signal output. Again, the insulation mat that we talked about, the mat isolates the operator from ground while testing, which greatly mitigates the shock hazard. So now, again, some of these uh, PPE and safeguards we've recently introduced. So we were just wanted to figure out what you're currently using in your workstation. And this also kind of gives you insight into what some other companies are using, maybe uh, what the market is dictating as the new trend to use instead of uh, one product to a different one. So Brittany will open up this poll and we'll share the results once we get a good number in. All right, Tony, so we had 30% say they use signal lights, 50% use insulation mats, 50% use DUT enclosures, 75% use warning signs, and 20% use dual palm switches. Awesome, thanks, Brittany. Um, so again, we do have customers that use our dual palm switches and it is a newer product, newer design, so we also we always appreciate feedback on, on how that's working for you. If it's uh, if, if it's something you've installed and just never had to think about before because they're working great, we'd love to hear that. Um, if you find that you're seeing some awkward behavior, please let us know as well. Um, we always want to get products in, whether it's your iPod tester or uh, palm switches or what have you, and kind of just troubleshoot and figure out what's going on because 
most of the time it's it's application related it's it's how you're testing it how you're using it characteristics of your product and so this is always good feedback to get from our customers um, so with that um, we're drawing to an end of our first webinar again this is electrical safety testing 101 right we're just more talking about the dangers in testing uh, what can happen uh, precautions you need to take electrical safety testing 102 which we'll be presenting uh, next month I believe is going to talk about the specific tests in your tester hypot test continuity test ground bond test um, insulation resistance test uh, leakage current testing uh, and what's actually happening to your instrument why you're seeing certain values um, so it's important to kind of continue um, with our webinar series. Um, these are links and standards that dictate what your workplace should be implementing. Um, if you need any info on that, feel free to reach out to Brittany. We also have all this on our website. If you look under resources and uh, different white papers, um, and again, even our, our YouTube channel, going back to old webinars on different topics, um, there's great information uh, in there presented by uh, Dwayne Davis who's been in the industry like over 50 years and he'll be retiring this year so it's it's important that you take advantage of uh, those presentations um, speaking of right arisafety.com um, support educational resources we put um, everything you need to know to become comfortable with HIPAA testing if you're new. Also in our accessories page, you'll see our test verification boxes. And um, with that, if you'd like a copy of this presentation, feel free to email Brittany Soha at Brittany.Soha at IconicsUSA.com. We've recently changed um, our email addresses now. We haven't been bought by a company. Iconics has always been um, kind of uh, our company the mother company whatever you want to call it our managing interest we just you know we have ARI safety we have um, SCI APT it's just a lot of different uh, companies under one umbrella so there's no new company the product isn't changing nothing's changing we're still the same company we're just now Iconics USA um, with that said more changes have, have occurred in this year we've got a lot of new systems um, which uh, eventually are going to streamline the process of how you get, you know, your RMAs and um, communication with people who are working on your instruments. But right now, w this new change has caused a bit of a, a delay uh, in, in turnaround times with calibration and repairs. So, you know, we want to apologize for that. We um, are doing the best we can to get those out as soon as possible. If you're still looking or waiting for your instruments feel free to reach out to our customer care group and um, we'll get you updates on that but again this is more just a transition phase so we want to apologize for those delays but it won't last long and you know again we our policy was um, you know three-day turnarounds or two-day turnarounds on calibrations repairs and we expect that to go back um, once this transition is over um, so beyond that I want to say thanks for joining me today and we look forward to seeing you uh, next month for our next webinar. Again, if you have, well, actually, I'll ask Syed, were there any questions that um, people posed during the webinar that you might want to chime in and, and consider talking about? Let's see, we have a few minutes left. Yeah, Tony, at this point, I don't see any questions uh, on the chat line. The only thing you might just want to go over again is the smart, you talked about smart GFI. On our instruments and just the range on those uh, that starts from like 0.5 all the way to 5 milliamps and in some some instruments it's adjustable and you know some of them it's like fixed at 450 microamps so if people just had once somebody asked just a clarification on that sure right so again just talking about what the GFI does right it's gonna identify if current is not returning to our ground port and it if it's not, well, then I'm going to shut off because I don't know where that current went. Now, usually, obviously, the current is going to ground, right? If it's not going to our port, it's going to ground. Now, if you're testing a product that is already connected to ground, well, then you don't want that GFI to trip all the time. So that's what the smart part of the GFI, right? The smart part of the GFI is I will disable GFI and I will identify if your product is connected to ground. Now, if you're not, 
the smart G, the GFI, uh, I believe in our Omnia, is settable from 0.5 milliamps all the way up to 5 milliamps, right? Now, if you're seeing 5 milliamps leak to ground, um, you know, you might want to check your, your test station setup. Why, are, why is it so leaky? but you can find that in uh, the manuals, right? Search Smart GFI, I believe in the Omnia and uh, the Ultra, it might be settable, I need to check again, but most of them are hard fixed in there and we can, that number is also in the spec. So if you are want to talk about a specific model, uh, feel free to reach out and we can uh, point you in the right directions when it comes to those specifications. Uh, so beyond that, um, again, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, we have a lot of people from Europe and overseas, and we look forward to bringing you new material in our webinars. And, and if there's any feedback, please feel free, out, free to reach out to Brittany, um, any other questions. So thanks again for your attention, and we look forward to seeing you next month.